Did you did you watch this Apple TV series called Severance? No, I read about it. I Oh, so you haven't started watching it yet? No. I think they're doing it episode by episode, like once a week, one episode, uh, three episodes down. Okay. I I I watched it as a homework to this. You did? Yeah. I'm glad you did homework. <laughs> It shows. Uh, it showed. Um, uh, it's an interesting concept. Um, this is, if an employee has to join this workforce, uh, they would be asked to go through a severance procedure, which is a, um, it's a, it's a neurological procedure. They'll cut open your brain and they will put in a yeah. chip, which will activate of course. during the lift when you are in the lift to the floor, mm. and this is on the maybe 10th floor, mm -hmm. uh, Plum's office is also on 10th floor. So, so <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're, you're uh, while on the middle of the elevator, you're about to reach to the floor, uh, this chip would get activated mm -hmm. and your memories of your personal life would be severed from here onwards at nine o'clock when you reach to the office until you leave the office, mm -hmm. which means you have no uh, emotional baggage, so-called baggage that you could bring to work. Uh, and whatever happens at the work and you're leaving the work, then this chip would be deactivated. Uh, and when you reach back home, you would have no memories of what happened at the work. Mm -hmm. Now, by this third episode, I am in a very uncomfortable state because I'm witnessing a very uncontrollable situation in which one of the employees, uh, she, has, she has taken the severance, she's in the office. In the office, she submits a resignation letter every day that I want to go out. Her resignation letter will only get approved if her outsee, that's what they call it, Mm -hmm. When you're outside the office, you're called as your outsee. Mm -hmm. When your outsee accept this resignation offer is when you would be officially let go. Okay. Now the thing is that this, this lady, she writes a resignation letter every day in the office because she's, she doesn't want to work in this office space. Mm -hmm. and, and her outsee rejects this offer letter. <laughs> the and she's stuck. Yeah. Wow. And she's stuck. You could imagine like she comes at nine in the morning, uh, walks into the office, she doesn't want to work. Wow. She goes out, I don't know what's happened outside, they haven't shown it yet, but she wants to go into the office when she's out. Hmm. That was a terrified laughter, <laughs> that was not an amused laughter, just to sort of clarify it for uh, everybody who's yeah, watching this. Yeah, of course, it's, it's totally terrified. But it's, uh, I'm it's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, um, that somebody sitting in Silicon Valley is probably working on this right now and we'll probably see a lot of capital being raised for this really promising frontier tech startup. Why, uh, why Silicon Valley? Why not Bangalore? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was trying because I am in Bangalore and I want to be nice to your, <laughs> your community. But yeah, no, absolutely. It's our community, I think. But it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's an idea I that I think is not so far-fetched. It's every, a lot of employees dream, isn't it? To have their employees come in totally sanitized uh, so that they can be at peak productivity, peak efficiency. You know, severance... Uh, a reality or not reality. We spend, as, as a normal working person, we spend majority of our waking life, uh, or as human beings uh, who are part of the workforce, we spend majority of our waking life at work. Yes. Uh, and the positive sides are, you know, we, we talked about it, that uh, an identity, a purpose, an income, on the negative side, there are physical and mental health issues that you may go through, uh, and you are probably going through. Um, we talked about the spectrum of mental health issues that you may be in, uh, right from uh, stress to disorder um, and everything in between. Um, there is a a lot of people, especially in the last two years, and I'm sure it's happening before as well, but last two years, there is a lot of 
talk about burnout. Yes. Um, tell us what is burnout? Burnout is actually an interesting one because it's probably uh, one of the uh, sort of mental health uh, issues, conditions, whatever you want to call it, that is easy to define, relatively easy to define. Or that's what society has decided, that it's easy to define burnout and it's a very simple definition. It is um, a condition when uh, chronic work-induced stress remains unmanaged. Uh, hmm. The result of that is burnout. So uh, it has a direct correlation with your work environment. Um, and uh, you're right, it has uh, come to the limelight uh, very sharply in the last two years. But burnout as a, as a cultural motive um, has taken hold. It's been a while since, you know, this exploded onto the mainstream. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about all kinds of, you know, you talked about severance. There's so many other shows and, you know, uh, pop culture yeah. uh, 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 creations one can talk about where burnout was a major theme. I think what has happened is a very confusing, in the last two years, a very confusing uh, 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 sort of coming together of different forces, different factors. Uh, as you mentioned uh, up top, uh, the blurring of the boundaries between home and work. Uh, if burnout is supposed to be entirely work-induced, hmm. but I'm not in the workplace, I'm at home, and technically I'm organizing my work day around my personal life, hmm. that is the narrative that, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, if you remember, uh, there, was, there was a little bit of optimism that hmm. we will have what was called then the Great Reset that, you know, uh, we are going to get more categorical uh, about differentiating home and work. Mm -hmm. But what has actually ended up happening is just the reverse. We are mm. in a nightmare soup right now mm. where these things are just completely jumbled up. Um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, cognitively, it's very confusing for an mm. individual mm. because uh, technically you are probably tending to your child or you're, you know, looking after your pet or you're doing a grocery run but you probably are always connected through your earphones or you're on Zoom all the time. And, you know, so, so um, a very dangerous, very uh, insidious shift in how people experience burnout, whereas earlier it was contained in the container called the workplace. Now it has spilled over and taken hold of our personal space as well. So, yeah, very, um, uh, very strange and scary moment. Hmm. Uh, what, are the, what are the visible signs of a burnout? Uh, and you talked about uh, this idea of chronic stress. Yes. Um, but could you elaborate, uh, give us more ideas of uh, how should I spot, uh, especially as, as HRs, people success leaders, founders, uh, how should they identify that somebody uh, is, is going through a burnout in their teams? Yeah, I think uh, one of the reasons burnout, um, uh, you know, is uh, neglected hmm. before it can become, before it becomes a full-blown crisis is because we have all these archetypes of, you know, the passionate, committed, sort of alpha team member, you know, always the first to raise their hand when a new challenge presents itself, workaholic, quote-unquote. Hustlers. Uh, hustlers, right? Hustle pawn, as we, as we call it in the business press, when we want to comment on the excesses of the startup world. Um, so it's, you know, these stereotypes get in the way of, uh, of um, a clear-eyed understanding of what burnout looks like. The signs could be, you know, anything ranging from emotional exhaustion, uh, inability to just function, really, right? I mean, I remember uh, a few years ago, there was this case in Japan of a 21-year-old employee working 72 hours straight and dying at her desk um, because of epileptic seizures that were induced by just overwork. So I think overwork, if you, if you want to get another word for burnout, which is a little less sort of clinical, it's overwork. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, if I look at my own story, if I, if I go back to, you know, uh, five years ago, when I had to take that sort of break from work, um, I had many classic signs of burnout, but I was lying to myself because my self-image was always of the person who's like, you know, uh, like say working 18 hours a day. And suddenly when it hit me, and I remember writing a LinkedIn post about it where I described that feeling as, you know, a, a soldier lying on a landmine. I actually took that reference from a movie, No Man's Land, of a soldier being completely, um, you know, sort of lying on a landmine and unable to move because if they try to get up, they're going to be blown uh, to pieces. Uh, so you, you feel like you, you, you're frozen, you know, it's sort of... Helpless. Can, helpless, frozen. And you often don't have the language to communicate what it is that you're going through hmm. because very often the symptoms that you experience when you have a burnout um, 
and I'm using the word symptom loosely here, that is not to indicate that burnout is a medical problem. There is some bureaucratic, uh, you know, some, some sort of uh, conversation going on between uh, various health agencies about whether burnout is a medical condition or not. At the moment, it is seen as a syndrome and not a full-blown disease or disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, but to go back to what I experienced, I remember, you know, feeling completely, uh, totally bewildered and confused as to what had taken hold of me. Mm -hmm. Because I never looked at myself as somebody who could ever have a burnout. Hmm. I thought this is what I thrive on, you know, this sort of 24-7, uh, always on uh, mode. So, uh, yeah, burnout has telltale signs. Hmm. I think this uh, this notion of helplessness, uh, this, could be, um, this could be very problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when can a person know whether this is a burnout uh, or whether they are uh, depressed and they need clinical intervention. Uh, because what I understand yeah. is that maybe burnout doesn't have a clinical uh, category yet. Mm. Um, so could, could this elevate to depression? Uh, where, how, how should we read the signs between burnout and depression? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to tell. There is a lot of uh, debate and dialogue within the mental health community, professionals. Um, and it is very easy for a lot of the symptoms of burnout to appear like the symptoms of depression. But look, it, it is really not relevant. Hmm. Um, what we try to tell people when we, are, uh, when we are doing our advocacy work is do not wait for a crisis to become a crisis before hmm. you reach out for help, hmm. right? So I think, um, you know, it does not matter. How does it matter whether it is seen by the mental health establishment as a disorder, or a clinical hmm. condition? If it is impeding your daily life, if you are unable to function for whatever reason, you should w stop thinking about the label. Hmm. You know, what is it uh, going to be called is immaterial. Reach out for help. Having said that, we also have to be cognizant that very often a person who is undergoing such a severe debilitating crisis mm. is not the best person, is not in the best place to actively reach out for help. Mm. And that is when the environment that the person is in has to take over mm. and support that person. Um, and this is critical in the workplace uh, in particular. Because if work is causing your uh, uh, suffering, right, um, and in your workplace there is no culture of even acknowledging that, mm. Right? Mm. Then the person's helplessness will only uh, multiply, mm. it will only get magnified. So I think we have to, you know, while yes, we are all, in con we are all adults and we are all in control of our lives um, and we have to take charge and reach out for help, but specifically with burnout, the organization's responsibility of, first of all, preventing burnout mm. and then if burnout does happen, to intervene at the right time and support the person with the right uh, support mechanisms is absolutely critical. Hmm. Uh, what is the role of um, a manager? Uh, you know, talk about a little bit of, of what could organizations do fundamentally uh, to step in and prevent burnout? Mm -hmm. uh, and how should a manager, what should be the role of a manager uh, in preventing burnout as well? Yeah, yeah. This is a good question. I think, um, especially the question about what can managers do, what can mm. bosses do. Mm. What we have to understand is while bosses are vilified all the time and managers are always held responsible for things going wrong, um, and some of it is justified, um, it is not as if bosses and managers are themselves immune. Mm. You, know, um, you know, being a leader of an organization of any size, and I've never run a company, you've run a company, uh, so you can tell me better, but I can imagine that it is um, it, it is a Herculean uh, challenge in today's climate to run a company. So first of all, I think I want to make that very clear, that mm. this is not one person's responsibility. Of course, if you are the leader, then uh, the moral responsibility and sometimes even the sort of statutory responsibility mm -hmm. um, does rest with you. But what can middle managers do, mm. uh, line managers do in an organization where they don't feel empowered? Mm. Right? So this is a conversation that has to start from the top. Mm. It has to start at the board level, mm. then at the CEO level, the CHRO level. And these, the upper management has really got to step in and really empower middle managers. Mm. And I'm, I mean, even when I say these things, I feel like I'm saying stuff that was talked about in the 1960s and 70s and we're still having this conversation. Yeah. Um, what can um, uh, companies do concretely to prevent burnout? Very simple. Um, don't let your employees overwork themselves to death. Hmm. 
um, you know, what happens typically, I, I can speak for my industry. Hmm. I have seen so many cases of uh, a team shrinking, a person leaving or being fired, and then that role never gets filled again. So what happens to that, to that, to that work? Hmm. It, the work does not cease to exist. Hmm. The work is simply shifted. Now that responsibility is simply shifted to the next person mm -hmm. on the line. And suddenly they're doing two people's job. Hmm. You know, they're still getting paid for one person's job, but they're doing two people's job. And it becomes normative. This yeah. becomes accepted. This becomes the norm. And uh, it's very simple. Plan in advance have contingency plans and business continuity plans in place and make sure, first of all, make sure that people are not overworked. Hmm. And then there are all sorts of other things which are very, you know, commonly talked about these days in the media. Don't send emails after 6 p.m. Don't let people work on weekends. I think the fundamental measure is hmm. make sure that people have, uh, you know, the only currency that they really need to feel in control of their lives hmm. is time, hmm. you know. Hmm. And of course, uh, you know, pay them fairly and all of that goes mm. beyond saying. But if you are able to focus on, you know, um, uh, making sure that your staffing needs are uh, filled. Mm. And look, this is not to say that, you know, you wouldn't have a situation suddenly where somebody has quit and you yeah. didn't have visibility into it, you know, as a leader. Um, and hiring takes time. Mm. So mm. what can you do in, in that situation? Mm. You just walk up to the person who's now expected to do, you know, this extra, this additional work. Mm. And you just have a frank, honest, authentic conversation. You sort of put your arms around them and say, look, I understand that uh, this is going to be really tough for you. I really get it. I'm sorry that this has happened. What can I do to support you? What will make this easier for you? Do you need an extra Friday off? Do you, you know, want to work from home on alternate, on alternate days? I'll make it as easy for you. And commit to what is realistically possible, hmm. you know, maybe you want to tell them that in two months you will fill that position, yeah. but then do fill it in two months, yeah. you know. So yeah, I would say just stop this culture of overwork. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting and, and also that the most important currency you could give is time. Yes. Um, uh, I remember this is uh, one, of the, one of the companies uh, who uh, an employee was joining our organization and they were uh, leaving uh, in a company which they were working for before mm -hmm. um, there was a three months notice period oh yes tell me about I it i was like <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is ridiculous uh, yeah autocratic trick yes. um, but uh, they had the reason uh, they rationalized this three months is it's a critical role we don't want our organization to overwork until we find a replacement, a replacement. who would take the handover from you. Yeah. The maximum notice period is three months. If that happens in a month's time, sure, mm. we could reduce the notice period as well. Mm. Right? So, so just thinking with you on that line, mm. uh, that an organization could on the, on the other side, extend the notice period times. Mm -hmm. You know, today the norms of notice periods are becoming one month and people are still pushing it to make it two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so. But this is interesting. Mm -hmm. I must say, I have mm -hmm. never, I've had several, I've had held several jobs mm -hmm. where uh, we had a three month notice period mm -hmm. and it was really, mm -hmm. I, mean, it, I, I couldn't understand the mm -hmm. logic. Um, but I really have not heard of any employer giving this explanation. Yeah. That we don't want our task for our workforce to be yeah. uh, overworked. Yeah. What generally is the case is yes, if you're a senior person, then your replacement will take time. Mm. And often people are asked to find their own replacements. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the moment a person tenders their resignation, mm. um, you are saying, hey, it's okay if um, if we make you terribly unhappy, mm. but you are not a part of our organization anymore, so we don't really mm. care. Now I have to think about the people who remain hmm. and so that they don't get overworked. That's an interesting one. I don't have a clear answer. I don't have a clear answer yeah. either. I mean, it's a, whether it's a business continuity, whether it's a overwork, um, uh, whether it's a replacement, uh, you know, all of these could be at play at the same time. Yeah.